Good morning, folks. Thanks for your patience. I like the way everybody is a little bit distant. That's, uh, that we're going to talk about this today, distance. <laughs> so um, uh, you're very welcome to North Clare Community Church. So if, if this is your first time here, you're so welcome. So God is so good. It's great to come together. Uh, who here likes to travel? Like traveling? Like nice places? Anybody like travel shows on TV? Yeah? Yeah, like we locally have lovely places like Kilrush and Lahinch, but there's places outside of this county that are lovely, right? <laughs> and, um, but how about Greece? Mm, yeah, people like Greece. I think, yeah, this is good. Um, today we're going to be going to Greece. The Apostle Paul, he goes to the beautiful city of Athens. But what is Greece famous for today, guys? What do you think? When you think of Greece, what do you think of? Olives, Best cheese, cheese. Coliseums. Coliseums, Mamma Mia, Mama Mia. <laughs> Greek weddings and salads. Greeks, I thought of Greek salad. That's what I thought of. So, and what else? Anne, ancient, ancient things. Yeah, culture. Yes, Anne, exactly. Okay, well, let's open up our Bibles. We're in Acts chapter 17. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles over here. It's great to follow along in God's Word. And the Apostle Paul is going to Athens, um, and he's bringing the message of Jesus. So Athens is famous for um, its culture. It's famous for art and architecture, famous for philosophy. Uh, so Socrates and Aristotle are from Athens. Uh, famous for its religion, for the Greek gods with a small g, and for its politics. And so this is a very famous uh, portion of Scripture where the Apostle Paul, in Acts chapter 17, he goes and he stands before uh, the philosophers of, of Athens. Paul arrives there, and no doubt, he arrives alone, and uh, no doubt he, he walks around, he sees these impressive buildings, these, the Pantheon, pa Pantheon, Pantheon, is up there at the top of the city of Athens. I haven't been there, my wife has been there. But it's called the Acropolis, the high place. It's right up the top of the city. And the Parthenon is up there. It's beautiful, uh, impressive buildings. So um, Paul walked around. The city of Athens is well past its former glory days. And um, poor, Paul is on his tourist trail. But Paul is not there on holidays. Paul is on a mission to bring the everlasting good news of Jesus there. So Let's look at, in Acts chapter 17 what Paul made of this city. And I'll read uh, the first few verses. And I'm picking it up from verse 16 of Acts chapter 17. And this is what the text says. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him, they brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new or latest thing. So let's pray before we uh, open, study God's word. Father, we just pray today that you would speak to us, Lord. Speak your, your comfort, your word. Speak your light and your truth to us, Lord. Lord, would you give us ears to hear what your spirit might say to us, Lord, as we simply just open up the word of God. In, and we ask this in Jesus' name. So Paul is on his second missionary journey. Um, he's been in these other Greek cities of Thessalonica, of Berea, of Philippi, uh, with Silas and with Timothy. And he's waiting for um, Timothy and Silas to come and to join him. He got ran out of the last city he was in, which is Berea. And verse 16 tells us about while Paul waited for Timothy and Silas in Athens, that his spirit was provoked when he saw that the city was given over to idols. 
It's been said about Athens that there was more gods or more statues in, in Athens than there were men. And the Greek religion, it basically involved the deification, the, to deify human attributes and the powers of nature. And it mainly ministered or catered for art and amusement. There was a lot of novelty in the Greek religion. But it was without any power. There was no power to change the, a life. So the Apostle Paul, it says he's provoked, he's disturbed, his spirit is disturbed when he sees that the city is given over to idols. Spiritually speaking, it's under idols. And Paul was grieved, so he takes action. And you see that in that first word in, in verse 17, therefore. So he takes action based on what he saw. And it says he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the Gentiles and Gentile worshipers in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. So, so Paul, he saw the spiritual state of Athens. It was under these idols. No matter how impressive a city it was, it was no life at all uh, without the Savior. It's a hopeless life, whether you're an aristocrat or a slave, because God, we need God for human flourishing. We need God uh, to be known by him and to know him. The good news of Jesus, the gospel, it brings human dignity, uh, the knowledge that we are made in God's image, that we are all equal, that we are one before God. Um, it brings, you know, the term inali inalienable rights or innate rights. These are rights that we have as human beings based on the fact that we are God's creatures, that we are made in the image of God. This gives us freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. But the gospel also is, is about justice, that the God of the universe is a God of justice, that he will, justice will be served, not just for the rich, but for the poor, for the needy, for the slave, or for the free. The gospel also gives us purpose that there is meaning to life, that God has a plan for our life, that God has revealed it. And the gospel also gives, tells us about the compassion of God, that God cares. But most importantly, the gospel declares freedom for our soul, redemption and the forgiveness of our sins, true freedom. So the tragedy and the emptiness of life under idols. Paul knows what the answer is. The answer for human flourishing, the answer is the Savior, Jesus Christ. So he goes, he gets the business, he goes to the synagogue, and he's in the Agora, the marketplace. And perhaps um, he's working there. We know that Paul, he was a builder of ten tents, he sold tents. And so he's meeting people. Uh, no doubt he's preaching to anybody who will listen. And it says there that, again, we looked at that the last time, that Paul reasoned in Athens. So he's dialoguing, he's discussing, he's, he's going over and back with people. And as he does that, God opens a door for the gospel. And in verse 18, it says, certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, they encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. So meet the philosophers of Athens. They want to debate Paul or argue with him. And they have two opposing belief systems, two different philosophies on life. And we can compare uh, what they believe today to what people believe in our day, what they believed in their day to what people believe today. And because it's so important to know uh, your, our audience, it's so important to know what people believe. So the Epicureans, I think the Epicureans are like your typical surfer. I'm a surfer, but I think the surfers are, make a good case for the Epicureans. So the Epicureans of that day, ultimately life was about enjoying, about just living the good life, uh, fine art, fine food, uh, the hedonistic lifestyle. Um, today, you know, it's a common thing that life is just about having the crack. And like having the crack is important, but it's not the um, chief aim to life. For the Epicureans, truth was by personal experience. Like uh, the postmodern view today, it's like 
well, this is my experience. This is my truth. So the Epicureans were atheists, but they had um, many of their gods. So the summary of the Epicureans is they enjoyed enjoying life. But for the Stoics, they were into enduring life. Life as a Stoic was about discipline and self-control, um, to be unmoved, that everything could be put down to fate, F-A-T-E, not faith, but everything could be put down to fate. And, of, you know, being unmoved, avoiding the emotions of high and low and avoiding pleasures of life. Um, for, the, for the Stoics, life was about, uh, one's reason was everything. You think of uh, Jordan Peterson today, discipline, self-control, to be unmoved. Um, I think Jordan is a bit of a Stoic. But they rejected uh, the pagan worship and, of idols and statutes, and they were pantheists. So the universe was out there. They believed in a one-world God. Everything was God, and, uh, but certainly not an, a personal uh, God that we know. So the Stoics and the Epicureans, they don't think much of the Apostle Paul. And they said here in verse 18, some said that he's a babbler, and the word means seed picker. In other words, he's going around picking up other people's ideas. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, do you ever have proud thoughts about yourself, how wonderful you are? Well, the philosophers of Athens had did, certainly did. And all of their philosophy, all it did was it fanned the flames of their pride. There was no need for or the help of God in their philosophy. Um, and in their lofty opinion, the Apostle Paul was an amateur. So some called him a babbler. Others said he seems to proclaim foreign gods because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, he doesn't change his message uh, for this academic, um, seemingly know-it-all audience. His message stays the same. He preaches Jesus and his resurrection. And in verse 19, it says there, they took him, they brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know this new doctrine of which you speak, for you bring some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know that these, what these things mean for all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there. They spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new, to hear the latest thing. So God's hand was on Paul, and as he was faithful to talk to the ones and twos about the Lord, the Lord opens a bigger door for him. <clears throat> So he's invited to the, this council uh, there on Mars Hill. Um, it was, the Areopagus was like the supreme court where the, the matters of the day, the civil matters or the religious matters were discussed. Um, Paul was not on trial, but this was a hearing. And I love these words in verse 22. It says, and then Paul stood up or D Paul stood in. You know, that's what God calls us to do is to stand as his witnesses. So verse 22, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, and here we go. I'll take a drink before we do this, and we'll read, a few, we'll read quite a few verses. So Paul there in Athens to the philosophers, and this is apparently how um, Socrates started his speech in the same place 300 years before when he was on trial. And he says, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with the ins inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their predetermined, pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they may grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live, we move, and we have our being. So it's interesting how Paul, how he connects with this audience. How is he going to springboard to this 
their minds are full of philosophy. So how is Paul going to connect to them? And this sermon is a masterpiece in communication. So he says, men of Athens, I perceive in all things that you are very superstitious or you're very religious. So he starts by complimenting them on how religious they are. And then he says, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. The, in Athens, they have so many objects of worship and Paul sees an altar with this inscription, the unknown God. The Athenians, just in case they missed some important deity, just in case they left somebody out, they have this altar to the unknown God. And Paul says, therefore, the one to whom you worship in ignorance, him I proclaim to you. <clears throat> so Paul gets their attention. He's got, there's a, a reference point in their culture that he highlights so, so he's talking the same language as them. And Paul now is going to correct their thinking. And he's going to give four points. And the first point is that God is the creator. So Paul explains to them the origin of life. And in verse 24, this is what it says. <clears throat> God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. So Paul, standing there on the um, Areopagus with the, the Parthenon up, up the top, the Acropolis, these impressive buildings, these temples built to the, the Greek gods all around, Paul makes that bold statement that the Creator doesn't dwell in temples. You can't make, you know, God created the universe. We can't make a room for such a God. God, He made us. Uh, we can't make um, a room for him. Point two, the first one is the creator. The second point is the goodness of God, the God who gives. In verse 25, Paul says, nor is God worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. God Almighty is self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything. But the Greek gods the, the normal thing was that they would bring um, the necessities or food to the temple and to give to their gods. But Paul's making the point, God doesn't need your food. He is the provider. He's not needy. And, um, and um, for myself as a surfer, Bali is one of the best places uh, for surfing in the world. But you see Hinduism all over Bali. And that's, that's normal. They bring food to their, to their idols each day. But God is the God who gives. The book of James tells us that go all the good gifts come from above, come from God. He's the giver of gifts. He's the giver of life. Uh, what could we give to Him? He needs nothing. And actually, we don't serve Him. God serves us. He gives us life, breath, and all things. So with those two statements, Paul has just wiped away the whole idea of the Greek religion. And in verse 26, Paul says, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. The people there in Athens, the philosophers, no doubt they thought that they were a higher race of people with their politics, their knowledge, and their culture. But Paul, he dismisses their, their pride. There is one human race. There is, we are from one blood. We're from one man um, and from through Adam and Noah. So God created all nations through one man. And it's so important that we know that God is our creator, that God made me. It's so important because when we know that God made us, we know that we have an obligation. We are his creature. And uh, I love what Lucas said during worship that you know, creation was a love story where God, you know, created uh, us to have relationship. So um, Darwin's theory of evolution, what we know um, hundreds of years later, what science can tell us today is that life does not come from non-life. You cannot, scientifically, you cannot get life from something that is non-life. We also know that Darwin's idea was that 
from non-life, life all of a sudden appeared, and that that life then began randomly to generate new genetic information. And over time, it became humans. You see, that's not science. That's a theory. Um, the idea of evolution from molecule to man is not scientifically possible. It's not seen as a scientific fact. Actually, it's in opposition to science. And I, I saw this this morning. This is what, from a scientist. It, it's clear scientific statement that says, there is no known observational process by which new genetic information can be added to an organism or a genetic code to bring something from a fish to an amphibian. You need new genetic information. With all we know about DNA and science now, we know that that's scientifically impossible. And also Darwin said that if what he said was right, the fossil record would prove with the transitionary species. But guess what? Hundreds of years of fossils, paleontologists digging, looking for fossils. There is no transitionary species in the fossil records. So the Bible says here, Paul says in verse 26, that God made from one blood every nation. That's what the Bible explains the origin of life. And it's so important that we recognize God. God is not only created us, God designed us. Our DNA has been designed. Bill Gates described DNA as a computer language, a computer code, but that it's way, way, way more complicated than anything that's ever been created by man. So Paul's third point was the governance of God, that God is the God of history. So by one blood, every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And then he says, and God has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grow for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. You know, God has shown so many mercies uh, showered so many blessings upon the, the Greeks that they may, the idea was that they would seek the Lord and perhaps find him. But we know from Romans chapter 1 that man does not seek the Lord. Man builds statues and worships idols. And, and God has predetermined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries. So God is the God of history. He's appointed each of us to be alive in this place at this time, and that's God, he's appointed us. Um, God has a plan and a purpose for our lives, and we are um, alive at this time for a purpose. And then he, Paul makes that very important point to the philosophers that he is not far. Uh, in the, you know, to the Stoics, the one world God of the universe was off and distant, um, but Paul preaches the living God who is knowable, who is near, and who has a concern for our problems and for our needs each day. Um, they could have asked the question, does this God know my name? And the answer would have been, yes, he does know your name. Um, and so here we go in verse 28. Paul says, for in him we live and we move and we have our being." Our very next breath is dependent on our, the living God, the Creator. So Paul quotes from some of their own poets, and he says in verse uh, 28, and he says, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the divine nature of God is like gold and silver, stone and something shaped by art and man's devising. Paul corrects their thinking. Man doesn't make God out of silver and gold. You can't make something to represent God uh, with a statue or an idol. So their thinking was all wrong. God makes man. Man does not make God. And so the three points so far Paul talks about God the creator, the goodness of God, the government of God, and for, Paul's fourth point was the grace of God. In verse 30, Paul says, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, 
but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. God in the past had overlooked, he had not judged their idolatry in the past, but now since the coming of Jesus, he commands all men everywhere to repent. So Paul tells him, you need to change your thinking about about God. You need to have a you need to have a, a understanding, a right understanding of who God is, a biblical understanding. No doubt Paul had much more to say to them, but he was probably looking at their faces and seeing an audience who didn't like what he was saying. I'm looking out at lots of smiling faces today. It looks like you're, you're, you're receiving the message, but Paul there at the Areopagus, um, yeah, I think he had a lot more to say, but so he just gives them a very direct message. And in verse 31, because God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So Paul brings a very direct message and Paul preaches this man. It's all about Jesus, that he is coming to judge this sick and broken world. The Areopagus was a place of judgment where the, the, it's like a Supreme Court where they would judge situations of legal matters going on in the day. But Paul is telling them, you are going to be judged. You are the one who are going to be judged. And in, in John chapter 5, verse 25, Jesus said that, that he is the judge. He said, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Um, judgment day, it will be Jesus Christ who judges us. So, and it, Paul tells them that his judgment is perfectly righteous. So Paul says, God has given proof of this. Um, you know, God, he loves to give us assurance, assurance of who he is so that we can trust him, but assurance that, that when we die, that we're going to go to heaven. God wants to give us that assurance that, so that we know that our sins are forgiven because of Jesus. And what is this proof? Well, the great sign is the resurrection of Jesus. God has demonstrated by the resurrection that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, Plato thought that the, there was no such thing as the resurrection, a bodily resurrection. The Greeks didn't like that idea. So the philosophers, they can hear no more, and the Bible says this, uh, sorry, a Bible commentator, he says this, I thought it was really good. <clears throat> it says, proud, sophisticated, wise Athens would not easily take to Paul's humbling message of the gospel, especially when he summarized all of Greek history in the phrase, the times of ignorance. So the soil there in Athens, it contained many weeds, but there was still a small harvest. In verse 32, it says, and when they heard of the, the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some of them joined him and believed. Among them, uh, Dion Dionysus, Don Isis, let's call him Don, let's call him Donny Isis. <laughs> Uh, Donny Isis, he's a real Irish uh, Greek man. Donny Isis, the Areopagite, and a woman called Damaris. Thank God for her easy name. And the others. So one of these Areopagites, uh, they did, one of these council of, of Athens there, believed in Jesus. And so, in summary, as just as I come to wrap up the message, God is good. Our God is, is to be praised. We can rejoice in our great God. And we can rejoice in the comfort and in the knowledge of God's character and in God's Son, in Jesus Christ. You know, God is the God who gives. He gives life, breath, and being. May we look to Him for good gifts. He is the good giver of all good gifts. God is concerned with our needs. Um, God knows our needs before we even pray for them. He is the provider. Um, that's such an encouraging thing about our God. Imagine 
these Greek gods, no concern. <laughs> these statues, no lifeless, dead, not real. God knows and he sees all. He cares. We can cast our burdens upon him. Our God is the God of justice. Justice will be served. And God is the God of grace. He's given his son for us to be forgiven. Jesus bled and died on a cross for you and me so that we could have a, the free gift of forgiveness, which Jesus paid for. And God is the God who wants us to walk closely with him. He wants us to be temples of the Holy Spirit. So may we, like Paul, arise and shine and stand as witnesses for Jesus, knowing that we are appointed for such a time as this. God has us here on the planet, in Europe, in, in Ireland, wherever we're from. God has us alive for this time, for a reason, for his glory. And um, someone could have said to Paul, as Paul went to Athens, oh, the Greeks, they have their religion. You know, Paul, you're just wasting your time. Don't bother going there. But people can have religion, but still be lost and still be heading towards a judgment day, still in their sins. Um, an idol cannot forgive sins. Jesus Christ was their only hope for the forgiveness of their sins. Uh, to save them from a lost eternity in hell. So Paul, he wasn't distracted by the wow. He wasn't distracted and dazzled by the entertainment in Athens. He was focused, Paul was focused on souls. He carried God's burden. He was grieved and he was disturbed that people were far from God. You know, um, how about us today? Idols. Uh, distractions, uh, dazzled, entertainment. Um, I, watched, um, a, I watched 10 minutes of Lionel Messi, uh, his greatest moments yesterday on YouTube, and I was just dazzled. I was just like, you know, it was actually the greatest players, they all talk about Messi. And I was like, wow, you know, there is so many idols today uh, for us to get caught up in, to, for us to be dazzled with, to be entertained. We live in an entertainment world. But an idol is something that stops us from seeing God or from seeking God. So the Bible tells us to flee from idols. You know, we've been bought, as Christians, we've been bought as a price. We belong to Jesus. And so may we turn to Him and have that right understanding of God a biblical understanding, but also to serve him, to love him with all our hearts because our hearts belong to him. He's our creator. He made us. We have an obligation to him. We owe our life to him. We owe our breath to him. It is right to serve God and to live for him, the God who designed creation. And may we remember his grace as us of us, whoever here, we're Christians, that we were lost. Um, remember where we've come from, that it was by his grace that he saved us. And so may we continue to pray for others who are lost, who don't know Jesus. Um, I just want to, next week is the start of, next Sunday is the start of prayer week. And um, just encourage you guys to take that seriously. Because prayer is the opportunity where we can break our comfort, just take a break from our entertainment and our comfort, where we ask God to break our hearts, where we ask God to disturb us about men's, men and women's eternal destination. And may we be like Paul and bring the gospel to our marketplace. Um, the last point on what did we say we would call him? Dionysus? Dionysus. Dionysus. Thanks, Brian. Did that change from the first time? Not, not Dionysus. <laughs> not Dionysus. Uh, Dionysus, the Areopagite. There was a gospel seed there in, in, in Athens. Paul was not wasting his time. The, the word of God will not return void. And it's significant when God saves the ones and the twos. 
God can do a whole lot with ones and twos. So let's pray. And, and last, last point, um, you know, the other, some, some believed in Jesus, some laughed at him, but then there was others. And they said, oh, come back and talk to us next week. We'll listen to you again next week. But the point is, did they ever hear them? Did they ever come back? Did they ever believe? Did they go to a lost eternity without Jesus? So the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Believe in Jesus today. And the, the Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you call out to Jesus, he will save you of your sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Paul, your servant in Athens. And Lord, thank you that the message was always the same, Lord. It was Jesus and your resurrection, Lord. And thank you, Jesus, that you died uh, to claim us, Lord, to win us for the Father. Thank you that we belong to you, Lord. Help us to keep our hearts free from idols, Lord. And help us, Lord, uh, in the week of prayer next week, starting in a week's time, Lord. May we be disturbed, Lord, and, and carry your burden for the lost, Lord, and pray. And so we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, man.